Welcome to the Fabulous 413. I'm Khalees Smith. And I'm Monty Belmonte. Today on the show, local authors Gwen Agna and Shelley Rotner had a catalog of children's books making seemingly difficult topics easy to both comprehend and empathize with. Their latest release is Finding Home, which tackles the circumstances of refugee children and their journey to adjust to new worlds. And we'll head over to the very edge of the 413 to check out the herds at Walker Farm, on Whortleberry Hill. Not only do they have one of the more English-sounding areas as part of their grazing lands, but they're one of the few farms to offer 100% grass-fed, humanely raised beef in the state. We'll talk to owner Joan Walker about her circuitous journey to agriculture and why raising Devon cows this way affects how good they are on the plate. Sorry, vegans, but first, let's take a far-out arts journey, shall we? Alabama Industrial School for Negro Children. Six to four, they let me go. They let me go from Mount Meigs, Alabama. In 1964. But with some cuts and bruises that I would never forget. This Thursday at the Drake and Amherst, Secret Planet welcomes cosmic blues man Lonnie Holly. Lonnie Holly is a child of the most difficult times and experiences. He was born the seventh of 27 children in Jim Crow, Alabama, and at the age of four was traded for a bottle of whiskey. As a child fleeing from foster parents, he was hit by a car and declared brain dead on arrival at the hospital. But at age 11, Lonnie was sent to the Alabama Industrial School for Negro Children, functionally a slave plantation featured in the award-winning 2023 podcast Unreformed, where he suffered some of the worst abuses you could imagine. That he's come out the other end of these experiences with anything but a hopeless broken heart already seems miraculous, but Lonnie Holly has channeled that trauma into art, sculpting, painting, filmmaking, and performing music. The New Yorker says Holly has an almost shamanistic quality, as if he's possessed all the wisdom of the universe. Lonnie was recently listed in The Guardian as one of the 30 artists to see live before you die. His sets are spontaneous creations, folk, jazz, gospel, blues. Holly's music contains hints of Stevie Wonder, Sun Ra, Lou Reed, Alice Coltrane, Gil Scott Heron, Miles Davis, but there's no obvious influence that takes precedence. Holly will be accompanied this Thursday Thursday at the Drake and Amherst by the Afrofuturist collective Mourning a Black Star out of Cleveland. They forge new pathways toward heart music by melding soul blues, electronics, avant poetics with futuristic beats. This sounds like it's going to be an incredible experience. It's going to be. I this have, Thursday. I, I have seen you play twice, and I tried to see you last year when you were at Big Ears, a festival I continue to talk about, but it is really fantastic. And every time we got there, it was totally at capacity. Like, you just filled space faces so quickly I couldn't get to see you again. But thank you for joining us, Lonnie. Thank you all for having me. With a background like we've described, coming out of the Jim Crow South and uh, experiencing what you experienced uh, that's chronicled in that podcast at the Alabama Industrial School, what was the first moment where you knew that art was going to be an exit for you out of all of this childhood trauma? Well, I had grew up going to church with my grandmother and my mother, and I had some parts of going to church. What you hear best is uh, that allow you to grow is like things like go and tell it over the mountain, and I want to be in that number. All of those kind of things is part of what I put into my music, but go and tell what over the mountain go and tell what our earthly conditions is all about, what we are all about as far as trying to live as the humanity, but with a brighter future for togetherness. But if stupidity is going to rule, then fools will be overruling the government. How do we keep stupidity from ruling, Lonnie Hall? You got any good advice there? You've seen a lot in your <laughs> years since you were born in 1950. What's, honestly, what's worked we're for you? for ideas. Yeah. Uh, a lot of times, you know, as young students, they get taught, just say no. Just say no to stupidity. <laughs> just, know that, just know that your brain, uh, especially now, we have been grown and groomed and cultivated to be one of the best nations on earth. Your music is eclectic, 
Khalees, how would you describe it? You've seen Lonnie. It's all over the place, but in a good way. Like it's it's hard to use singular terms to pin it down. But music is something relatively new for you, right? You didn't start doing music until 2012, I think, is when your first album came out? Or were you always doing music, but this was the first time you got to put it, it to it, wax? It was, it was the first time that I had been in a studio. Mm-hmm. And, but listening and observing and singing, moaning and groaning and whistling has probably always been a part of the Af- African-American culture. We did it in the fields. We did it after getting out of the field. We did it in the process of protesting for our civil rights. We got together. We sung songs. We did music. Uh, Music was always a part of our goddesship for our children to follow. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's just something that I inherited. Your visual art, or at least your your sculptures, are primarily made with found objects. But I think that there is a quality of that that found melody, found riffs, and found like words to repeat in your music as well. Do you see that connection there? Is that connection intentional? Is it not called freestyling? <laughs> Am I not freestyling everything that I do? <laughs> That's true. That's true. At freestyling my art, I'm finding all of these trash, garbage, and debris pieces. Nobody else won't. Nobody is paying attention. That is cluttering up our world. And now I have a chance to put it together and reconstruct it in a constructed manner where we could learn from it, if no more, than put it into, like, William Arnett came along and he saw reasons to say, okay, I need to collect some of this and I need to get photographs of it, I need to write about it, I need to catalog it, and I need to put it in books. So along with uh, William Arnett and people like James Fonda that saw potential in what we was doing as black Americans, colored America, uh, just got in out of the Negro attitude and saying, okay, we got our freedom now. What can we use to enhance our freedom? And it was around us all the time. It was in the dishes, the creeks. It was up and down the alleys. It was in our material that we were throwing away all the time. We're speaking with Lonnie Holly, who will be at the Drake and Amherst this Thursday, January 11th, with Morning a Black Star. He's a performer, a multifaceted performer there and right. artist and sculptor. And what and I think. Filmmaker. And <laughs> filmmaker. And uh, you mentioned the, the idea of trash. And I don't think it's fair to call your work trash, but there's elements of it that are repurposed, found. Mm-hmm. Your grandmother had a relationship with the landfill near you, and you, I think, if I remember reading correctly, were also responsible for picking up trash at a drive-in near where you were from. So do you have a, a lifelong relationship with making beauty out of what other people perceive as trash? First, I was introduced to seeing things, mm-hmm. things that were supposed to have been new, but within a few seconds or a few months, it was turned into trash. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Every year, we make way for new things. And every three months after that year come in, we have already trashed them. Just look and just try to use your imagination to go where I'm going in order to be able to tell my story about how we are cluttering, over-cluttering, rather. And, and again, I try to, because I've been to some of the bigger landfills that's on Earth, and I have to think about the largest cities that is putting out the most trash and what it's going to be like if that landfill, because it's like a bowl, if it gets full of water, then if you ever had anything in your bathtub that is floatable and you let the bathtub flow up with water, the first thing that spilled out was that that could float. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You understand? When we had the incident with Katrina, Katrina was not so awesome because of its wind and water, but it was the conditions of the water rising and causing all the flotation 
to be such a hazard. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The oil floated. Everything that is hazard to our health is floatable. So now it's being soaked into the materials and things. I, I know that I don't supposed to be trying to explain uh, the the complicated thing because we don't have that much time. <laughs> but the complication, the complication that I have to study is because of my childhood encounters and experiences. Mm-hmm. I think that's important too, even like touching on it, not to keep getting into your visual art, but there is this fluidity that I think you introduce to all of these found pieces, like getting them to to flow together, to get them to rise to the top together in that sort of filling your bowl sort of way, but it ends up being more organic and more grounded and more visceral. I think that's one of the really compelling things about your art. The the way that your pieces come together, the way that those found pieces comes together is so evocative. You get an immediate response from both your music and your visual arts. And I think it's just because of introducing that sort of fluidity to these things that you find to try and get people to pay more attention to these things that they throw away, that it ends up being so compelling. The thing about our hurt and hurtful not only just taking licks and being knocked out or being abused and beaten, those kind of hurts is painful to the exterior. But what is painful to the interior? Uh, when our site delivers certain sites to us that is harmful for our brain to digest, uh, I'm trying to, as an artist, I'm trying to help people to affiliate with that. I'm trying to get them to understand. Sin is believing, but reality is so f***ed up. I did a song called I Woke Up in a F***ed Up America, <laughs> but it was not so much of the profanity that what people said that, that I used in that song, but it was the reality that I used in that song. Mm-hmm. I think that's, that's what we got to be able to get around with uh, a lot of the hip-hop music and a lot of the pop music, a lot of the music of today, where we say it's too much profanity. We have to look at why are the people arguing and cussing in these different settings or trying to get people to understand them or understand their lyrics a lot better. Even if I went to the military right now and I'm getting ready to turn 74 years old, Mm -hmm. I'm going to have to follow somebody's orders. And if I don't follow their orders, they're going to scream and holler and curse at me until I learn to go by their rules and regulations. We still is under the same conditions, the same very conditions that it took to make America. We're still under those conditions. And don't think that they are going to change anytime soon because we need to be commanded by our teachers. We need to understand that our teachers are trying to give us the very best of their ability. And the one that is coach enough to be the very best that we are, we need to pay attention right now. We just came out of a, and it's still raining pretty hard outside now. <laughs> but my thing is, my son came in and said, Daddy, it, I went down the street and mostly the, the storm had blown so much and it's like flooding all the streets and things. Our drains are stopped up. Not only have our, our drains stopped up, our roots are weak. They are not solidly rooted. So any bit of wetness that comes along, it's going to wet the roots of anything that is trying to grow. And then when something uh, of a harsh wind comes along, it's going to be able to blow it down or blow it out of the ground pretty easily. So if I'm going along, uh, if I crossed America and I stopped along the way up and down the creeks and the ditches and I collected these materials, that was affecting the roots. And I brought them home with me, and I did like some of my ancestors might have did, hung them upside down where where they can dry, where I can see the tenderness of the root. See the tenderness. In a song I think you all know about, it's a try a little tenderness. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I, I try to show a little tenderness because that is the very thing that is holding us together as a people and when that tenderness keep getting broken 
you asked me earlier, what is the quicksand field of stupidity? The quicksand field of stupidity is those places that we fall in so deep because of hurt, because of sadness, because of jealousy, animosity, and hatred. We fall in them so deep that we can't even get ourselves out and and not even willing to help anyone else out of the quicksand fields of stupidity. Well, we hope that you can help pull us out of those quicksand fields of stupidity this Thursday night, Lonnie Holly, at the Drake and Amherst, where you'll be playing with Morning a Black Star. Your new album made the uh, year-end lists of Paste and Pitchfork and Brooklyn Vegan. It's got some big wigs that people may know playing on it, like Michael Stipe and Sharon Van Etten and Justin Vernon. Uh, it should be a wonderful show on Thursday. And frankly, like touring with Morning a Black Star, how do you find people to collaborate with? Do they find you? Do you seek people out? I thank all the collaborators that I've collaborated with on all of my albums that's out. I'm looking forward to my plan with Morning a Black Star and we are and Lee Baines and we're gonna bring uh, a wonderful show and I say thumbs up to Mother Universe. I appreciate you all choosing me uh, to talk to me and try to make it plain for other people to understand. We appreciate you, Lonnie Holly. This has been a delight. You're going to be at the Drake and Amherst this Thursday with Morning of Black Star. Thank you so much. Thank you all very much. I actually have that bumper sticker on my car. Nice. (laughs) Later in the show, explaining tough subjects like refugee acclimation and gender spectrums to kids with authors Gwen Agna and Shelley Rotner the authors of the new book, Finding Home, and more. But up next, beef! Joan Walker of Walker Farm and Farm in Wardleberry Hill dishes about her grass-fed goodness from goodly Devon cows. You're listening to The Fabulous 413 on 88.5 NEPM. Time for a Local Hero Spotlight with Phil Corman from CESA, the Local Hero folks, and Joan Walker, owner of Walker Farm at Wardleberry Hill in West Brookfield slash... New Brain Tree. This is a new year, 2024. Oh, We've been boy. doing the fabulous 413 and being very 413 centric. And you are pushing the envelope of 413 I am there, Joan. Like 100 feet from it. <laughs> <laughs> but what you are doing on the very cusp of the 413, Joan, is raising beef cattle. Correct. This is not something that you have been doing all your life. This is a, a, a sort of latish life career change. It is. Tell us that story. All right. So I was a respiratory therapist, and I used to get laid off before the nurses, so I got laid off not frequently, but occasionally. Anyway. Enough to make it annoying. Enough like, to make it I'm annoying. laid off so, again. Laid off again. In my 50s, I get laid off, and I said, enough is enough. What else can I do? My husband had grown up on the farm we were on. Um, we had moved back there when his parents passed, and I kind of got interested. What could I do with that? So I was growing vegetables. I sold them on a roadside stand, and I started to be very interested in what I ate because I got diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, and I was very fat. And said, okay, what do I eat the most of? What can I get the most bang for my buck of? And I like beef. I could be a carnivore very easily. Mm -hmm. So the more I went down that rabbit hole of, okay, so I want them raised humanely. I want them killed humanely. I want them to be yummy. I want them to be grass-fed, yada, 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 yada. The more I looked at what I wanted, nobody did it all. So I said to hubby, hey, we get a farm. What if I get a cow? (laughs) The more I talked to people, the more they thought, hey, I'd buy that. So I bought a small horse. Heard, and now I run a fairly a larger medium sized herd, and the rest is history. I put in a meat store, and that's what I do. When you say a medium to large herd, how many head are we talking? I about? run an average of sixty. Depends on if they're coming or going. But um, <laughs> 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 you know, you get twenty babies, and you get a big herd. That's... But then you're going to be sending some, right. so it kind of fluctuates. And to that end, is it just beef or is it beef and veal? Only beef. No, Only beef. no babies. No babies. People call me for veal and it's like, no, have you ever been there when the baby's born? No, I know. I they're the cutest. They are. But by three, they're like adolescent males. They're oh, yeah. time to you, go. Time to go out on your own. Do you hear that, my son? <laughs> 
It is. It is time. And I yeah. remember running from the herd of cattle that my school had across <laughs> the prairie. So yes. And while they will meet their end and become our food, you are doing your best to try to raise them humanely in a way that no one else really in New England is doing, right? Well, I'm the only certified humane and certified grass-fed, 100% beef producer in New England. So yes, there are people that are nice to their animals, but I kind of decided if I was going to do it, I wanted to do it the whole way. I took a good year in planning this to decide if I actually could kill something I raised. No, I'm not going to kill it myself, but it's going to die. However, the thing that changed that for me was Temple Grandin. I took a couple Mm -hmm. courses with her, and she said to me, you know... Nature isn't kind. If you could let them all live nicely and some coyote is going to kill the old one and they're not going to euthanize them. They're going to eat them alive. So and I've saved next to our farmer's baby that the coyote was trying to drag the baby out of the mother giving birth. So nature isn't kind. But to quote her, but we can be. Mm. So I wanted them to live the best life they could. In fact, I will take their end. You couldn't imagine how quickly they are killed. They don't even blink their eyes. And I'll take that any day. I don't know what's in store for me, but I would take that. And if you take care of the animals and you take care of the land, you're going to have a a great product to eat that's going to be healthy for the land and healthy for you. We're speaking with Joan Walker, the owner of Walker Farm at Whortleberry Hill in West Brookfield slash New Braintree right on the cusp of the fabulous 413 (laughs) and Phil Corman from CISA, the local hero folks. From respiratory therapist (laughs) to cattle raiser, how did you go about that learning curve? I took probably four years. I took every course I could. Massachusetts isn't set up well for that. I took some from UMass, but mostly it was from um, Cornell. And I also read every book I could, and I visited as many farms and farmers as I could. And I hate to say it, but a lot of times, because I had such high standards for what I wanted to do, if I was going to bother, I can just go next door and buy the next door. I mean, we're in a very rural community, much like the Valley is. I could go next door and buy the next door guy's beef, but I wanted it how I wanted it and raised how I wanted it. And... In order to do that, I really needed to do it myself. But that was a long learning curve, and I didn't want to kill any of the animals on the way, so I made sure I took animal welfare and animal handling courses along the way, as well as reading many books. But it was a good four years before I actually got the animals. And when they came off the truck, I had never, other than, hi, nice cow, never touched an animal in my life life. Wow. How. And what about your husband? Did he have any experience he with had, cattle? No. Well, yeah, a little. His brother had 4-H cows and he had a horse, but no, never. So yeah, we jumped in. But that's sometimes what you got to do. Just decide this is what you want to do. Prepare yourself and jump in. What's the worst that could happen? I suppose that I could get killed by a cow. But that would have been in an instant, and then your end would have been perfect. Yeah. Right, well, exactly. But I, I don't c- know. Being trampled usually, mm. like... Now, they're going to gore you with their horns. You're well, not going to be trampled. Right. <laughs> this graphic depiction of your demise is brought to you by Joan Walker, <laughs> owner of Walker Farm at Waterbury Hill. <laughs> so you're processing on the farm. No, oh, I am not. You're not. So there is a... Can I say names? There's sure. a slaughterhouse, Adams... Yep. Kudos to them up in Athol. They are luckily the closest to me, but they are one of the only animal welfare approved slaughterhouses around. There are some, but they are the closest to me and animal welfare approved. And um, there was a mom that owned it, and that generation had a different attitude than the siblings that own it now. And um, in fact, the one of the animal welfare approved inspectors inspected them. He was the old USDA inspector and then inspected me like right after. And I said, okay, I go to them. You see what I'm doing? Do I need to be concerned about anything? And he said, nope. And when I interviewed slaughterhouses, which I did, and I watched them kill animals, obviously not mine, I have full confidence in them. So I always think of farming as kind of two parts. I mean, one is, is one a good farmer? Is one doing all one needs to do to bring the harvest? In this case, it's animals. But the other part, which I think it's downplayed often, is the business part. Because running a business is different than raising the animals. And sadly, oftentimes you need both sets of skills. So how did you learn the second set of skills, which is running your own business? Well, running my own business was um, like everybody. It's kind of um, a learn as you go. However, my husband has on the farm a machine shop. 
So he was running his own business. Um, when he got laid off, he went to that full time. So we both kind of had it, not within the same amount of years, but we both within a decade had a change of what we did. But so I was used to having to deal with people. And obviously, even if you're a respiratory therapist in a hospital or and I was in home care for a lot of time, it's all mm-hmm. a business. So anybody that thinks you're not getting any business sense, no matter what you do, is not taking advantage of what they're learning. We're all working for businesses. I started, though, really early um, and really small. So, like, I was harvesting one or two cows at a time, and those were from freezers in my barn. But people (laughs) still found me because I was organic, I was humane, I was this and that. And then as I got so it was going to now double to seven animals a year, (laughs) I put up a meat store. And that was with help of an APR um, enhancement grant from. So kudos to the state of Massachusetts because they gave me a grant for part of it. And then I was able to put up a store. And the rest is, I just sell from the store. (laughs) I can talk to the people and talk about the animals, show them the animals. We had some that came yesterday and had pictures taken with the animals. They were thrilled. Um, So people have to go from the 413 100 feet into the 508 (laughs) to get their meat? We're we're not talking about that. That's coming Some of the land is coming on 413, I'm sure. There you go. Yeah, 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 there we go. So you're in. You're officially in. (laughs) We've got a toe in, and that's the part that counts. Um, (laughs) What was the most surprising thing about starting this entire endeavor? Because you basically started from the ground up. I mean, you had access to a farm, but like neither you nor your husband knew about animal husbandry or building a business of this type. What was the thing that surprised you most? It's a small thing, but it's not anything really to do with the business to do the animals. They're just like cats and dogs. They all have a personality. They all have preferences. They all can be snitty. They all can want you to stop and pat my butt now and do it for an hour like your dog does. I was amazed at how each individual animal has its own personality and also what families they stay in. I have one who was my grumpiest one in the beginning. In fact, I wasn't going to keep her. And then I learned what she liked and what she didn't like. And now she's wonderful. But she's got five gener- four generations now. Because she's such a good mom. Learning that, I think it's like going from being a dog person to a cat person or something. You've got to learn a whole new species. And they're they're animals, same as anything else. You know, you can, my nephew and I used to train grasshoppers to jump over things when we were kids. (laughs) They're sentient somehow, you know. (laughs) So um, that was the biggest thing for me is how individual the animals were. The other thing is how many people on the business side are sick of eating crap. We're all stuck eating crap for the most part here and there, but there are so many people sick. And whenever I say to somebody, I made hot dogs because I love them and I won't eat them because I don't don't know what's in them. I've never had anybody go, yep, everybody's sick of eating crap. Yeah. Well, speaking of, you have a cooler. I do. Joan Walker, owner of Walker Farm at Waterbury Hill in West Brookfield. I'm so happy that you make hot dogs. There you go. I mean, in general, like, I am such a fan of sausage in general. And I think that too. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) These are hot dogs. They are made with my beef. So it's 100% grass fed, it is organic, it is 100% humane. And this little old Lithuanian guy down in Meriden, Connecticut. There we go. Smokes them for me. Because you're Lithuanian, right? Is that what you said? I have a little in me. I mean, fingers work. Right? <laughs> and then this is, again, kielbasi from my animals. You can't see her face. Hot dog taste happy. test. Mwah. <laughs> Try the kielbasi, too. I have a thing with, with hot dogs. Like, they need natural casings. I don't like yes, skinless ones. Like, I agree. They, they need snap. Yeah. Those have great flavor and great snap to them. Thank sure you. Do. Thank you. I was going to bring you a steak in this, and I said, no, everybody does that. I'm going to bring you the what. This is better finger food these for are sharing. My, next to my hot sausage, these are my best sellers. But I bring these everywhere because they just are portable. They're yummy. But who doesn't like hot dogs? They're pricey because they're organic, and I've done them. Now i got to bring them to the guy in Merritt, and he's got to smoke them. But they buy them for their kids because the kids won't eat other hot dogs because they taste... Phil's looking, going, I, if I ate meat. I yeah. Eat. <laughs> oh, darn, I have to eat Phil's share. Yes. Oh, no. Phil's, Phil's a vegetarian, and that's okay. That is. I have a number of customers that are vegetarian other than my meat because their number one concern of why they're vegetarian isn't the meat itself. It's that how are the animals raised. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I won't go on the riff about how many animals are killed while you are harvesting your wheat, et cetera, but... <laughs> 
Get I hay, it. so I know what I kill when yeah. I'm out hay. <laughs> Things get stuck. Anyway. <laughs> and kind of coming full circle to that, that, part of what inspired you to do this after being laid off as a respiratory therapist was for to get your, your own life in, in a Correct. semblance of order. So, you, and so tell us how, how that has gone. So uh, that has gone unbelievably. So I was very diabetic. Um, can go from zero to 60 in my um, blood sugar, zero to 400 in my blood sugar in a minute. However, um, it all started, everybody I think goes the same way. I kind of started eating local. Then I started eating clean. Then I started then I, paleo. And then the people that usually end up on the low-carb track start usually all, we all kind of go into, unless somebody just says, oh, I'm going to lose weight for New Year's and go keto. But um, <laughs> I found the better I ate, the better my blood sugar was. And little by little, amazingly, the weight was coming off a little bit. I am only 5'3", and I was 250 pounds. I mean, I could still get out of the chair, but it wasn't comfortable. So then once I kind of started looking into this, I said, okay, so I don't want to be on insulin. I don't want to be on metformin. I don't want to be on all this stuff. And what if I went low carb? And I felt even better. So truly, like I said, I could be a carnivore because I feel great. But it doesn't change my blood sugar at all. I'm on nothing now. Wow. I have a, most of my customers come to me because they have a health challenge and they want clean meat. And most of those people are autoimmune. Just as an interest uh, to the listeners, I have five people that were brain four, uh, stage four brain cancer, go home and die, that have cured it with their food. I have a lot of epileptics that handle it with their food. They're not on any drugs. So we are what we eat, and you are what you eat eats. I don't know how anybody thinks that if they can eat meat that's been grazing on glyphosate-laden food can not have some of that go into them. I always say, how do you want your dinner to have lived? Joan Walker, the owner of Walker Farm at Waterbury Hill in West Brookfield, new Braintree right on the cusp of the fabulous the 413. The toe in the 413. With some <laughs> cows that are grazing in the 413, too, and they're tasting delicious to us in hot dog and kielbasa form. And you can find out more about Joan and Walker Farm and all sorts of other producers of meat and other things through CISA and Phil Corman at buylocalfood.org. I'm going to eat more hot dogs now. Yeah, me all too. Right, there you go. <laughs> Up next, we'll take an auditory look at a photo book about young refugees and immigrants with Gwen Agna and Shelley Rotner, authors of the new book, Finding Home. You're listening to The Fabulous 413 on 88.5 NEPM. Welcome back to The Fabulous 413. I'm Monty Belmonte. And I'm Khalees Smith. Our guests are Gwen Agna and Shelley Rotner, authors of the new book, Finding Home. The Horn Book reviewer Julie Hakim Azam says of the book, there are many reasons why people seek sanctuary. Some families are uprooted because of war or economic hardship. This book addresses these situations and also alerts readers to the growing number of families who seek sanctuary because of environmental or climate changes. Stunning photographs of individual children, intergenerational relatives and friends immediately catch the eye with bright colors, varied moods and engaged expression, expressions presenting a truly global and inclusive representation of childhood and family. The photos were taken by Shelley Rotner, a freelance ph photojournalist whose work has appeared in Time Magazine, National Geographic's World Magazine, Condé Nast Traveler, Outside magazine, Food and Wine, and more. She is also the author and photo illustrator of over 30 award-winning children's books. Shelley has also traveled extensively for UNICEF documenting programs about children, women, and education. The book was co-authored by Shelley with Gwen Agna, who has been an educator for over 45 years. She's a legend in the, in the <laughs> valley. Most recently, the principal of the Jackson Street Elementary School in Northampton. She was trained in early childhood education, strove to promote the principles of child and human development in elementary school classrooms. She was born in Myanmar and lived in Haiti as a child. She, lived as, uh, she served as the Northampton Public Schools Early Childhood and Civil Rights Coordinator in the 80s and 90s. In this position, she worked to incorporate social justice, anti-bias, and anti-racism in all aspects of classroom practice. She continued this work as the leader of the Jackson Street School and was recently re-elected as one of two at-large members of the Northampton School Committee. Gwen Agna, Shelley Rotner, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. We're so happy to be here. <laughs> Absolutely. So firstly, the book is beautiful. Oh, like, thank it's, you. It's yes, really so. wonderful. And we haven't... I, we've said definitely that it... It has a, this really beautiful ability to simplify something that is incredibly complex in a way that is easy to to explain. Why is that what you wanted to do and what you have done across these children's books? Well, um, the books 
are um, published mostly for younger children. Um, the voices could be four to seven year olds, four to eight year olds. And um, the two books that Gwen and I have done together sort of took a, a turn for me in my career because of our editor at HarperCollins who introduced speech balloons, speech bubbles. Uh -huh. And I was like, oh, I don't know, but I've run the risk in the past of looking like a textbook right. with, with photographs. Mm -hmm. And she goes, we'll hold your hand. We work with the designer. And it's my passion now because of my photojournalism background. Mm -hmm. And kids speak. Kids have a lot to say. And it was just the experience of the, the children were learning language. And English, they, they really caught on. So they were the interpreters for the parents also. But they wanted to talk. They felt honored to be seen. They felt honored to be heard. And I, I have such gratitude for these families and the courage and that they were open to share their lives and, and, and be welcomed. Yeah, and ostensibly, I mean, it's a children's book, but in the back you have both glossaries and guides for the adults in these children's lives who are reading, presumably reading them these books. Mm -hmm. Was that always the intention to have something to help the adults make it a little bit easier for them too? Yes, I, I, that's where I come in, I think, as an educator, because I can envision these both of our books being read to children in schools as well as in homes and libraries. And I think the adults who are reading these books to the children need to have some guidance around them. Um, and they, we provided them with glossary. We provided them with some support and resources so that if they wanted to extend their um, reading to the kids, they could extend it through different resources. And, We're, and while I, I earlier said the book was geared to say four to seven, four to eight, it's for all ages. Yeah. And you know, it's a picture book, so it sort of de is designated. You know, they have to put the age range. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's for everybody, and it's for these kids. It's for their friends. It's for the educators. It's for the world. And, and speaking yeah. of these kids, and we're speaking with Shelley Rotner and Glenn, uh, Gwen Agna about their new book, Finding Home. These are not actors or people that you've had pose for pictures in this book. These are real people and they're real mm -hmm. stories. There was an article earlier this year that Gwen sent to me today uh, that says they fled the Taliban as Kabul fell. Now the Zahid family is cooking and building a new life. This is based in Northampton. This is one of the families that's mm -hmm. in the book as well. So how do, do you find these families to come and take their picture? Well, for me, it was that and they were... And this is Gwen. Yeah, this is Gwen. They, they were at Jackson Street School when, before I retired. Uh -huh. And I was able to make good relationships with those families and understand the trauma that they went through and also to provide them with the welcome that they needed to feel more secure. So that when we decided to do a book about new arrivals to our country, I already had some relationships with them. And I think they were really ready to tell a little bit of their story. Some were more reluctant than others, but I think that they were happy to s speak their truth. And mm -hmm. their truth is pretty powerful. Mm. Yeah, it's beautiful and heartbreaking at yes. the same time. Yes. When you see a little kid yeah. with a, a thought bubble that says that yeah. my parents said we had to run. Mm -hmm. I mean, it breaks my heart as I, a parent. I, I started, um, I read an article in, in the local paper and, you know, my background just cl clicked in and I was curious and um, sort of I was traveling around the world in the valley here mm. meeting kids who had escaped and come from all countries and um, and that's kind of how it started rolling and I joined a circle of care because I was heartbroken mm -hmm. and it's how could you not want to help and do something and I became an educational coordinator for a some of the families in Amherst to begin with. And I love these families. I've gotten to know, we go apple picking, you know, I care, care about them. And I hope they can find places to live, which is getting tricky now after right. the year mm -hmm. of, be, they, they can't take work because they'll lose their benefits. And they're very qualified, you know, and here they are. What, what are they going to do? Yeah. You're wrestling with these big issues mm. in a way that 
it speaks to me, who's 45 years old, but I'm mm-hmm. assuming that seven-year-olds read this too mm-hmm. and, and can maybe empathize with these situations. Uh, what is some of the feedback that you get from kids, either kids who have experienced having to leave and find a new home or kids who are, are interacting with people who have had to leave in their schools? I think it's been a little bit mixed. Um, I read this to my granddaughter, who's three and a half, mm-hmm. and she had a kind of a reaction like, this is a little hard to hear. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. I had to explain to her that these were kids who had to come quickly and couldn't come necessarily with their dads or their moms. Yeah. And right. it, so, they could only bring what they could carry yeah, in, in their, their backpack. backpack. Right. So they, they really, we need to have people very carefully read these books, too. And But I think that we've had really very positive reactions to that the kids especially mm-hmm. they're just so happy that they're able to speak about their experience and to see themselves in those beautiful photos that Shelley takes yeah. we're, we're delivering the books now today was the book birthday oh, oh yeah because we have the digital copy and now you have the actual copy it always mm-hmm. looks better in it print does. buy right. books it yes does. oh I can't tell you to do things and so no direct calls <laughs> to action sorry <laughs> <laughs> but you know I do want to just say that part of our mission i and all my books is inclusivity. They just want to be kids. Yeah. And it's like kids worrying about climate change. It's ki- they're kids. And we made a point of capturing them, you know, that they have art. They have grass on the soccer fields. Yeah. They are kids. Yeah. I, and I think that with your photos especially, like, there is something – I appreciated in reading it, like, all the way through to the end that there was no real, like, trauma baiting with the right, photos. Right, right. Like, they're just kids out being kids, like, eating foods that they mm-hmm. like, hanging out with their friends, hanging out with their relatives. And there was something, like, really wonderful about, like, them just being themselves and mm-hmm. still having, like, these heavy things that they've been through to deal with, but there's still joy. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that that balance between, like, making sure that that other kids see that happening simultaneously is really important mm-hmm. and you struck that balance really well. Thank you. Sure. That's well, not really a question, but you know, yeah. we're oh, it, on it. And you know, that's why in our <laughs> our back matter as you refer to that we had a a local social worker who had worked with those families while I was still principal mm. and she was able to take care of that part. I think she really knew that these kids would want to be just like everybody else and not have anybody pay attention to them any more than usual. But she worked with them and knew that there was there were stories that needed to be shared. And you can check out some of these stories in the new book, Finding Home, from Gwen Agna and Shelley Rotner. Uh, you have another controversial book that you worked on mm-hmm. about a year ago. And coming up, we'll talk more with these two authors about their previous book, True You, A Gender Journey. And perhaps we'll get into the gender queer book debate happening in Great Barrington right now. <laughs> oh, my goodness. You're listening to The Fabulous 413 on 88.5 NEPM. Welcome back to the Fabulous 413. We are here with local authors Gwen Agna and Shelley Rotner, who are the authors of Finding Home. But they have another book that came out before that called True You, which looks at gender across the spectrum. And perhaps that one is a little more controversial. Mm-hmm. Although it did also have more kids that I recognized. I knew <laughs> Me I too. Knew a lot more kids and families kids. in that book that we we all know here. Mm-hmm. So, And a lot of these kids are from Western Massachusetts. Right. Yes. Yes. Full disclosure. My kids have been in one of your books, yes. Shelley Rotner. Yes. yes. <laughs> Not, neither of these two. but <laughs> And th- you were saying earlier, Gwen, mm-hmm. that this, uh, you know, people are rejecting this book mm-hmm. across the country. Talk a little bit about that. Some yeah, people. Not, some, yeah, people. Some, some people. Some yeah. people. You know, and I, I'm actually not surprised. I think some people were surprised because we live in this p- happy valley here where the right. people think, oh, you know, it's all hunky-dory. The problem is, I think, that with every issue that comes up, if the parents feel uncomfortable with it, they're going to make it more uncomfortable for their kids. Right. And so my experience in reading to groups of kids was that some parents stood up and took their kids out mm-hmm. because it was a subject that they didn't want to address with their kids. 
And it's that subject that I think makes it harder for everyone. Mm. But I had a lot of experience at Jackson Street before I retired with families and kids who were looking at identity and exploring and thinking about different pronouns and their families were. And it just became pretty much everyday conversation. And it really wasn't a big deal. The way it should be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the earlier the better, I feel yes. like, much like languages in general, like the more fluid you get with something, the more acclimated you get to something earlier mm -hmm. on, mm -hmm. the better off it, you end up being mm -hmm. with it later on. And with in light of what's happening in Great Barrington, mm -hmm. <laughs> I think so, that becomes even more apparent. Yeah. For those who haven't been following the Great Barrington uh, story, the, and now just Max Page, who's from Amherst, Massachusetts, president of the Mass Teachers Association, made uh, an, a statement about it today. Mm -hmm. The the Berkshire Hills Regional School District um, said that they, that that union there is providing support for a teacher whose classroom was visited by police officers yeah. investigating a book complaint about the book called Gender Queer. So mm -hmm. this is part of that same conversation. You were saying earlier, Shelley, that um, educators have purchased this book and then have to uh, return it because there's an outcry from the community. Exactly. Yeah. And, and the book actually got picked by the New York Public Library as one of the best books last year. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, in New York, I guess that's broad. Yeah. <laughs> There's like a, a lot of, you know, yeah. a big range. It's a great library. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But how do we get the book into the hands of the kids and the families that would benefit from this book? And we have had older kids respond, like, or a Manny mm -hmm. at a photo shoot was saying, oh, I wish I had this book when I was growing up. Yep. And, you know, <laughs> we... we Create these to help, um, and that's how Gwen and I came together in collaboration, because she had just retired. I knew she had books within, mm. <laughs> and I said, "What do you really need?" And this book was Gwen's idea. Wow! Mm -hmm. And it, she, yeah, as you mentioned before, a new word that I didn't know before: back matter. There is uh, mm -hmm. lots of there's a glossary there. There's mm -hmm. resources. There's therapeutic support. So mm -hmm. that it goes above and beyond just pictures and people, you know, kids exploring mm -hmm. their gender identity in photo form. It, it can be a valuable resource for families that are trying to navigate through this. Yes, exactly. And I think that's what some of the families have said, that it is very helpful to them. And it's a journalistic approach. I, our editor said that one time, and I think that's what we're hanging our hat on a bit, that families are seeing it as really as news in a way mm -hmm. that they're um, able to understand what's going on for their kids or for their kids' families or their kids' Kids, friends, you know, all those yeah. things happen in, in schools. And sometimes the parents don't know what's going on or the caregivers. And, you know, I love our back matter in this one because it has a, a letter from a student who went through Jackson Street all the way from kindergarten to fifth grade. And uh -huh. it, she speaks about her identity now and the support she got all the way along. And I, I just think that this is about safety mm -hmm. and security, and we need to keep our kids safe. And that's why I, I just feel so strongly that this book is so critical to have in the world. It, the, and it's a springboard for conversation. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, so... Especially because so much of it is firsthand. And, mm -hmm. like, I think both speech bubbles and with the back mm -hmm. matter at the end, like all those resources, this is a really interesting met methodology to apply to children's books. And now you've done it mm -hmm. across two. Do you have plans to do more in this style? <laughs> yes, oh, we do. Fingers crossed. We yes. already... We, <laughs> yes, we've written, yep. we've written two. <laughs> yep. We have a prototype ready. Oh. Um, Do you want to divulge what the subject matter is? Sure. I, I, we can tell you the title. Yeah. It's called Growing Our Future. Uh-huh. Oh. And it's about? about climate change. Uh -huh. and Yay! But yes. about kindness. Mm -hmm. It's right. about how together we can grow our future. Yeah, and take care of our world because... Yeah. You know, the children know, and I think people underestimate what children know and can do and think about, and they are already thinking, this is not going well, for, and the adults are not taking care of our world for us, <laughs> and we need Sad them to know. Sorry, kids. Sorry. <laughs> It's, it's always a defeating thing when kids realize that, like, adults in their life are not taking care of the thing and they kind of have to take care yeah. of it on their own. And it's just sort of like, oh, mm -hmm. we've all failed you, haven't we? Mm -hmm. The gender identity book is called True You, A Gender Journey. The uh, book, the new book, is called <laughs> Finding Home, Words from Kids Seeking Sanctuary. It's written by Gwen Agna and Shelley Rotner with photographs by Shelley Rotner, both of whom have joined us in studio. Thank you both so much for sharing oh, all of thank this. You. Thank you so really much. Really appreciate the opportunity. <laughs>
opportunity to do this. Absolutely. Yes. This was great. Thank and you. Wednesday on the Fabulous 413, we'll speak with Alexis Breitniker of Valley Community Development Corporation. We'll hear about the strides being made in affordable housing in Hampshire County. Plus another word of the year with resident wordster Emily Brewster, this one from the American Dialect Society. And a song cycle for peace in the Middle East with Mayor Berger from Haydenville Congregational Church. Special thanks to Spouse Happy Valley Guitar Orchestra Suitcase Junket Jimmy Cliff, MIA Against Me, Lonnie Holly, who you are listening to right now and who will be at the Drake in Amherst this Thursday alongside Morning a Black Star. Going to be a great show. I'm going to be there. You can come say hi. I'm Monty Belmonte. I'm Khalee Smith. We'll see you tomorrow on the Fabulous 413. Shall we soon be out of the field?